Yeah, welcome back to the channel. The Swag Academy is here. We are in the building. I'm your host, Swaggy C. I'm in the building, and I appreciate you guys for coming back to the channel. If you have not seen me in action before, don't even hit the subscribe button. Watch the video and see if I give you value. If I do, promise me you will not only subscribe, you will like the video. But for my loyal subscribers, I appreciate you for turning to the video. Today is actually not a video for you. If you've actually been watching my channel for the last year, I've obviously talked about, you know, how to trade Forex. What is Forex and like an entire breakdown of it. But I feel like I've done it in a basic format. I didn't do it with this new setup. I didn't do it as long as I should have. I didn't go over every single topic. So let me actually backtrack a little bit. It, it might actually be for some of you guys. You watch the video yourselves and let me you know, know, but this is more so for the newbie traders who have been DMing me saying, I still don't understand what everything is right about the market. So I'm gonna go step by step from beginning to end and talk about the Forex market, period, as a whole. Now, for my subscribers, I want you guys to know that my academy is still dropping in about two and a half weeks. My new academy. I still have an academy now, but I'm telling you guys, when I tell you this new academy is going to be crazy, I'm not even going to say it. Like I said, wait the two weeks, you'll see it yourself, and I guarantee you, you'll think the same. But without further ado, let's get into this breakdown. It's going to be a very long video, but I'm going to break it down as simple as possible. This is called Day Trading Simplified right now before i get into the theme song because i know it was a cute theme song right there I'm not gonna do it just yet i want you guys to understand before you watch the video trading in the market is not easy right so i'm going to try to break it down as simply as i can that's what i'm going to try to do i'm not in here to say trading in the market is easy and, and every single person should be that's what i'm trying to do not at all but for those who are interested in trading in the market i know it can be very very hard reading a bunch of articles online watching a bunch of youtube videos from boring youtubers or reading articles and not being able to ask any questions or really understand it or get like a voice behind it so i am here i have something in my eye and i'm not going to edit it out but sorry guys oh that burned anyway uh my goal for you guys here is to watch this video and understand it at a basic level at an intermediate level at an advanced level as much you know as as great as you can and that is my job for today make it as simple as possible for you guys so without further ado i'm gonna go flush my eye out while the theme song is playing i'll holler at you guys so before we start this video i have to get the rag on i'm feeling orange today right i had a choice between blue or or pink I'm feeling orange today i'm about to be rocking all right, we here, we lit. So, uh, first thing I want to talk about is what is Forex and is it exactly what I see on social media? Yes and no, right? The no comes into play where it's like, you see all these people driving nice cars and doing, you know, living the greatest life in the world and on vacation, they're showing a chart. That's not Forex, that is an MLM, right? They are trying to recruit you so you can recruit other people, have a whole downline of, of pitching and pitching and doing up ranks and down ranks and all this chairman platinum they have a suit on and they have a, a globe you know infomercial around them they got the handout that's an mlm that is like the red-headed stepchild of forex right like i i, I want you guys to understand there, there's a difference right they're selling forex but i want you guys to understand if you're trading forex you do not have to join an mlm right like i want to make that very very clear because MLMs have caused a major destruction to Forex. Everybody on Twitter thinks Forex is automatically a scam because there's so many MLMs in Forex. Nobody on Twitter thinks the stock market is a scam. Why? Because there's not that many MLMs in the stock market, right? But I want you guys to understand that is the difference, right? MLMs are that. Forex, the yes part, is what they are trading or what they're promoting, right? So the Forex market, what is it, right? It is different from the stock market because in the stock market, you are investing in companies, right? You are investing in things. I want you guys to understand the difference between an investor and a trader. An investor is somebody who invests in a company, they buy and they hold, and they're trying to hold for an extended period of time, right? Whether it's a year, two years, three years. If you thought Apple was gonna be popping when they were still low, low, low on the totem pole and you invested into it, AKA you bought shares, giving you part ownership in the company, 
a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, when you know their shares you know increase in value, you make a lot of money, right? Trading is opposite because you can buy and sell, and you're trading more on a day-to-day -day basis, right? You're you're buying and you're selling more frequently. You're making your money a lot quicker, and you're also losing your money a lot quicker because it's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, right? So that's the major differences between or quick difference between the stock market and the forex market, right? Now, with Forex, you're not buying companies like you are in the stock market. You are trading currencies against each other. Currencies? Yes, currencies. Like the United States dollar. I wish I had my, my wallet to show you guys a dollar. But you're trading the United States dollar versus Great Britain's pound, right? Versus the euro, versus the Japanese yen. All these countries, their currencies. You're trading them against each other. And I'm going to give so many examples, you know, throughout this whole video. What I mean by that is... Each country is paired with another country, right? They're paired with countries all over the world, right? Because when you want to travel from the United States to Europe, right, you can't use the United States dollar to pay for things over there. You have to exchange, you know, your currency for their currency, right? You go to, you know, uh, Japan, you can't pay for things in the United States dollars. You got to exchange it for the yen, right? So each country that's compared against each other has an exchange rate. And basically, you have two countries against each other, right? And I'm going to show it right here on the iPad. You have two countries against each other. Let's say the United States and let's say, you know, uh, Great Britain, right? If you think one country is going to be stronger than the other in comparison, right? You buy that currency against that other currency, right? If you think one's going to be weaker, you sell it, right? That's the, the plus of the Forex market. You're, you have the ability to sell in this market, right? You can't. Like some, a lot of times in the stock market, there's a lot of restrictions. You can't just come in and just sell something. You need to have like have a physical. When I mean physical, I don't mean in your hand, but like a physical share of something, right? In the forex market, it's all free floating. Like it's literally, you can come in. You don't. You think it's going down? You can sell, right? But let me actually go to the iPad really quick and show you guys an example. If I can find the pin for the iPad, where is it at? Oh, right here. Okay, I'm tripping, guys. All right. So, like I said, each country has an exchange rate, right? So, like. If you're trading Great Britain and, you know, the euro, like we just talked about, they will be compared against each other. So what you will see is something like this, right? You will see, let me get my glasses on actually too, because I'm blind without it, right? GBP, which stands for obviously Great Britain Pound, right? Versus the United States dollar, right? United USD States dollar right so you will see that you know every single country is like the abbreviation and then their currency name right so the japanese yen would be j p y right so you'll see these little abbreviations when you're actually trading or actually looking on these sites to understand what what's going on with them right so we're looking at you know let's just say gbp usd right we're talking about the exchange rate right and what the exchange rate basically is is how much of this does it cost to get this when you're you know traveling to the country right and this is not how you make money in the market but i just want to explain to you guys you have gbp and this is how it, it'll like look on the screen right gbp usd equals let's just say 1.30 right and it'll look like this right where it would be like you know five numbers aside of decimal and all that extra stuff um what this means is one gbp aka one pound equals currently a dollar and 30 cents we will ignore the other three decimals right just means a dollar and 30 cents right so basically if this goes from one or this stays at one and this goes to 1.31 0 0 0 1.32 0 0 0 then obviously the, uh the pound is increasing in strength versus the united states dollar why because it's still one pound but now one pound will give you a dollar and 32 cents right period end of story right i use one pound i wish i had i don't have a pound obviously but like one pound before used to give you a dollar and 30 cents now all of a sudden it gives you a dollar 32 cents a dollar 35 cents a dollar 36 cents that means it costs more to get one pound right the pound is, is being very strong right now the united states dollar is being weak in comparison and vice versa applies right so if this goes from 1.30 to 1.29, 1.28, 0, 0, 0, right? Right? Um, I'll just keep it like that as well, right? If, if, if it goes lower and lower, what does that mean? That means 
the pound is getting weaker versus the United States dollar. Why? Because it costs less to acquire one pound, right? It costs a lot less of if I have a dollar and 27 cents, I will get a full pound in, in the UK, right? Or if I have dollar 30 cents from the past, I, I would get a dollar as well, right? So that's how, you know, the exchange rates are seen. How you make money is, again, you're trading. Now you're speculating, right? Speculating means you're basically predicting what's going to happen. So if you, and we're going to get to this later on in the video on how you're able to predict certain things, right? But if you believe the pound is going to increase in strength in comparison to the US dollar, right? You believe this 1.30 exchange rate is going to increase and all of a sudden for one pound, it's now going to cost or it's going to uh, be the exchange rate. Actually, just keep at one point. Sorry, guys. 1.3000, right? It's now going to be 1.32500, right? Let's just say it's it's that, right? If you think it's going to increase and let's say get there, we'll talk about that later, and you buy it, right? You would make money, right? If you if price is currently right here and you buy it, we'll talk about lot sizes and how to actually, you know, make more money and more money or less money. But let's just keep it very, very simple for now. If you buy it, by the time price gets to 1.32500, you've done made a certain amount of money. How that money is determined, that's called a lot size, and we'll get to that. But that's basically how you make money in this market. You speculate based on a variety of factors, right? Technical analysis, we'll get to all that later. Fundamental analysis and sentiment, right? So technical is basically as you're looking at the chart. And fundamentals is like the news of the world, right? CNBC, Bloomberg, all that extra stuff, right? And um, obviously the central banks and, and the government. And sentiment is basically the opinion of everybody, right? What, what, is, what are the forums online saying? What are the, the broadcasters and what's being reported online? Like that's, that's all, that's what makes up the market. So if you buy it based on everything you're hearing, remember, you're not just guessing because guessing is gambling, right? And people have this confusion. They think that, let me actually show my face for a second. People actually think that, you know, trading in the market is a gamble. And to a certain extent, I can understand what they're saying. But to me, in my opinion, this whole video is all my opinion, except for the obviously the obvious facts on how to actually trade. Gambling is going to Vegas and you don't know what's going on. You're literally pulling the shot slot machine. You're hoping for the best. You're shooting dice. You really don't know what's going on. You're playing a card game like you don't know what's going on. You're, you're merely hoping and guessing. With the market, you're speculating based on five, six, seven different reasons. I think it's gonna go up because of this, this, this. You know, they increase interest rates, right? The market looks like this in terms of technical analysis, right? This news comes out. The unemployment rate got worse for this country, right? That is how you are able to predict if price is gonna go up or down. Now, it's not it's not easy because there's a lot of factors you gotta, you know, play in um, and you gotta consider but it's calculated risk, right? So trading in the stock market and the forex market, in my opinion, is calculated risk. It's still risky, and to a certain you know extent, I can see how people may think it's gambling, but I associate gambling with going to Vegas and just guessing. You have, you're literally just merely hoping for the best. This is not, you're not hoping for the best. You're, you're a little bit, you're hoping for the best, but you can say, I think it's gonna go up because of this, 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 and that. Confluences. Remember that definition. Confluences is basically when, you know, your reasons for getting in a trade. We'll get to that later. Same thing applies um, if you, oh, I'm actually highlighting. Sorry, guys. Same thing applies if you think the pound is going to get weaker in comparison to the U.S. dollar. You think it's going to go down to 1.28000, right? All you got to do is sell. If you sell and it goes down, you make money as well, right? Now, if you think it's going to go down to 1.28000 and it price is at 1.30 and you sold it, excuse me, but it actually goes to 1.31000, you lose money, right? You lose. Same thing if you're buying and it goes down, you lose money, right? Same thing if it's at 1.3000 and you think it's going to go to 1.31, so you buy, right? And it goes to 1.30 400 you're in profit right it's not at that 1.31000 left uh yet it's at 
400, it had to go to 1.30, 500, 1.30, 600, all the way to, you know, 1.30, and then 1.31 flat. That is your buy position, right? So it's on its way there. So you're making money, right? You can look at your phone, you see you're making money, depending on what lot size you use, you're making money. And if all of a sudden it just reverses and all of a sudden goes back down to 1.30, 300, 1.30, all the way down to 1.29, 400, you are now losing, right? You are now losing money, right? So I wanted to explain that to you guys. That is, you know, basically how you make money and lose money in the market. Which also brings me to my next point, right? People are asking who trades Forex, right? Oh, all these millennials trade Forex, relax. We barely make up 10%, let alone six, seven, eight percent of this market. Like this, the participants in this market are these central banks and major banks and hedge funds and corporations. Like they control the majority of the market. I know social media would like to allow you to believe that Forex is only traded for individuals and scammers. Nope. Major banks all across the world, hedge funds, corporations are trading in the market, right? So when we look at these central banks, understand that each country has a central bank, right? So you have the United States, we got the Federal Reserve, you got the United Kingdom, they have the Bank of England, you have, um, let's say Japan, right? The Bank of Japan, they all have, you know, a central bank. And what is the job of the central bank? It's to, you know, stabilize prices, they control the exchange rate that we trade off of, right? They control inflation speed, how fast in, uh, inflation is rising, right? They control the purchasing power of the currency, aka, similar to, it's basically inflation, right? Basically, this $10 bill, right? What can I buy with this ten dollar bill right chips soda this that and that and then obviously 10 20 years from now what i used to could be able to could buy with this ten dollars i can't buy the same things anymore why because the currency is getting devalued right over time we've seen the purchasing power of the dollar and, and other you know currencies as well not be able to buy the same things over time that's called inflation right inflation is constantly you know rolls over time that's in the here and there right but they all play a major major part in the forex market right they're they're a lot of the time they are controlling the transactions in the forex market these corporations you got to understand these countries and these corporations are doing business with other countries right so for example a country like china right who's a a, a major exporting country right they they do a lot of manufacturing there they, they create a lot of things and they they export them out to other countries right they have to understand what the other economy is doing right what their gdp is a gross domestic product and we'll talk about that you know later on in the video as well right they got to understand how strong is their currency right and how strong is it in comparison to theirs right you guys may think that like the gdp and the usd are competing against each other and they hate each other and they're at war no like that's they're literally just compared against each other in this forex market they're not against each other right obviously each economy or each country wants to have the strongest economy right but they're not competing against each other in like that regard right they're just in comparison right sometimes price may go up sometimes it may go down right but it's not gonna go dramatically from 1.300 to like 2.12 or all the way down to zero why because that affects one country too much they can't be that weak or that uh, strong in comparison to another country emerging countries that's a different story and we'll, like i said we're going to get into the major and minor pairs right but gbp like great britain is a major currency the united states dollar is a major currency so they're never going to be too strong or too weak against the other thailand the thailand bot right that's different. Mexican peso, that's different. They're all emerging developing countries, right? They're not as strong as the GBP or Japan or even China, right? Or even the United States. They're not as developed, right? They don't have as high as a GDP as we all do, right? So you may see like a crazy exchange rate with the United States dollar and the Thailand bot, right? Because obviously the United States economy is so much stronger and bigger than Thailand. But when it comes to GDP and these obviously stronger countries, it's not going to be that crazy. Either here or there, I'm getting off subject a little bit. I just want you guys to know like us individuals, we're called retail traders, right? That's what we're called basically. We do not trade the majority of the market right all we're doing is speculating and doing x y and z like with the market and trying to make money but what i'm trading me trading the market right now or just me alone i'm not going to move the market right something donald trump tweets is going to move the market so i want you guys to understand right even joe biden right the government right the federal reserve especially jerome powell has a major effect on the united states dollar right because obviously the, the federal reserve is in control of that right i want you guys to understand when you're in this market you're not in this market to be you know 
move the market and do this and do that. No, your only job is to make money reacting to what's going on, predicting, right? But your goal is to try to figure out what's going on with, the, with these central banks and what the government is trying to do and what the, the future outlook of the economy is going to be. And your goal is to react based on what they're doing because they can move the market. We can't react on what they're doing and try to make money, right? Moving on, people may ask, you know, what are the major differences between the stock market and the Forex market? And why is, you know, Forex so alluring to, to trade, right? Why are, you know, people like me and other people around the world trading Forex instead of the stock market, right? I am, you know, interested in the stock market as well, and, and I'm an investor as well. But coming into this market, it has such a easier you know way to get into the market right has such an easier access in the stock market right so with the stock market you have to have if you're trading right you have to have a minimum of twenty five thousand dollars to trade with right and if you don't you're only able to trade three times a week and i'm gonna go back to the ipad and i'm actually gonna delete everything really quick as I'm talking to you guys, I still, I'm just going to show you guys, I still have the stuff we did, you know, early on in the video, but I want to actually write some notes down just so you guys can obviously pay attention and, you know, understand it, right? So with the stock market, right? So let's just say stocks, you got to have $25,000 and it's called the PDT rule, right? And what that means is you got to have 25 racks. And if you don't, you're only allowed to make three trades per week right which sucks unless you're a swing trader and if you're a swing trader you should have twenty five thousand in the stock market right because swing trading is basically when you're trading for a longer period of time i got to talk about that later difference between scalping intraday swing and position trading but right this second right the pt rule for the stock market you got to have twenty five thousand. so it's a lot easier to enter in the forex market why because in a forex market you are able to enter with as little as a hundred dollars now that's not recommended right we would love for you to enter and have more breathing room with your trades in case you lose some you know some money you want to have you know extra in the account right but you're able to trade with a hundred dollars fifty dollars right so you're so you you can get in a lot faster right so that's one of the main differences between forex and stock so people may ask why is it so alluring to trade in the forex market is because of this alone right you don't have to put up too much money to try to learn how to trade right and one thing you should understand though is technical analysis is the same worldwide even fundamentals now the type of fundamentals you're paying attention to are different because with the stock market you're looking you know for for tesla you're looking at elon musk tweets right for exactly tesla right or reports and earnings growth right and all this extra stuff when it comes to tesla right q1 q2 q3 q4 the whole earnings report with the forex market the fundamentals may be like what is the federal reserve saying what is the bank of japan saying what is monetary policy and what is you know uh what's going on with the country and their interest rates are they hiking it are they bringing it down like that's what you're kind of paying attention to but overall fundamentals is the news technicals is kind of the same right i can look at a a, a, a forex chart right now and you can completely erase it and put like a netflix chart right now and i can read it clear as day can clearly read the graph and know what's going on so i want you guys to understand that just because you are learning forex right now learning the technical analysis part of forex if you decide forex is not for you you may ask can i go to the stock market and at least know what technical analysis is yes like you will be able to open a stock chart up right now and be able to i wouldn't say just trade anything because like obviously different factors weigh in you got to figure out like the timing and all that extra stuff but yes you'll be able to read netflix and be like oh this is why it went down this is why it went up you'll be able to read it clears that right that's one reason. The second reason is the Forex market is open 24 hours a day, right? Five days a week, 24 hours a day. And the, uh, the ability to create your own schedule makes it very, very, you know, lovely to, to partake in, right? So create own schedule 24 five in the Forex market, which is also called FX. I don't know why I didn't even say that earlier in the video. And with the stock market, it's open five days a week, but it's only open about six and a half to about eight and a half hours a day right they have you know after hours you know when it comes to trading even though the volume kind of decreases 
six and a half hours, five days a week. And the reason I said six and a half is because they have like a bell. Like the bell rings when like the trading day starts. That's at 9.30 Eastern time. And the bell rings to like kind of close it out at four, right? So it's really six and a half, even though you include the after hours. Neither here nor there, let me get my glasses back on. But again, the reason why a lot of people choose to trade Forex over stocks is because they can choose their schedule, right? You can work overnight at a job and then sleep and then wake up and you're still able to trade in the forex market where the stock market you got to trade sometime between 9 30 and 4 realistically 9 30 and like maybe 12 or 1 and then the market starts to die down a little bit but you know you have to be there right like there's there's no trading at 9 p.m 10 p.m whereas the forex market you can right some people might like to trade at 8 9 10 p.m at night right now there's different pairs that apply to certain times you trade right like I'll wait. I'll wait for that part a little bit later, right? But there's certain pairs to, that you got to trade at certain times, but it's open 24 hours a day and allows you to make your own schedule, right? So there's a lot of reason. That's the reason why I started trading, you know, in college, right? When I first came across investing and trading, and I was like, okay, I, I want to start trading because I don't have a lot of money to just invest and buy some shares and just hold it for a few years. Forex was the easier route because it allowed me an easier access to entry, right? Whereas uh, the stock market that 25 racks was very heavy on a homie you feel me now one of the biggest things that a lot of new people try to ask me is that do i have to sit at a chart 24 hours a day or even eight hours a day or i may not have the time and you know realistically no you do not now studying right this is clearly a long video right it's clearly over an hour long right it's very very long Studying is going to take you a lot longer than trading, right? Like when I studied, I studied day and night for months, right? Even a year, right? And now when I look at the market, I'm not saying you can get on the market and just trade in five minutes. No, what I'm saying is after you know what you're doing, you're able to look at the market and try to analyze it within 15, 20 minutes. And you can kind of, you can have a bias and a prediction on where the market is going to go. You're not right all the time, but it becomes easier to read and understand this is what's going on. Let me read some fundamentals, some news. Okay, this is what's coming out. Okay, you match this. Okay, the technicals say this. Boom. All right, it's going to drop. That's my prediction, right? So you're able to have a bias a lot easier when you know what you're doing right on top of that you don't have to set up the chart 24 5 right because depending on the pair you're trading even if you like let's say you like to trade early in the morning right and and the pair you like to trade only moves early in the morning and we'll get to pairs probably in the next section or the next time i'm talking right you like to do that but you work in the morning you can set an alert that'll allow you to get like a little text message right that'll tell you hey the market is here do you want to get in and you can get in based on that alert when you're at work right you can set alerts what you can also do right so basically when you get into the market there's, there's a few things right there's a thing called market execution there's a thing called buy stop buy limit and there's a thing called sell stop sell limit right so what that means is market execution means you open up your chart and you click buy you click sell immediately and you're entered into the trade immediately. Let me go back to the iPad, put the glasses back on. I'm not even leave my glasses on for the rest of the video. Um, maybe not. Let me not even lie to myself. Um, uh, market execution, right? This just means you get in instantly. It executes you, right? You click buy. I'm just going to do BNS. You click buy. You get in for a buy. You click sell. You get in for a sell, right? A buy stop means price and i'm going to like i said i have my charts already pulled up here right if i want to obviously go here you guys can see my charts clear as there we're going to get to the charts in uh, a few but i want to just draw it out like in a second right what a buy stop is basically when you think the market is going to go up higher than it is but it's down here right you just get a buy stop so let me do a bar replay and what bar replay is and I got to explain this. This is why I want to do it on the iPad, right? Bar replay just erases everything in front so you can imagine what the price is doing back here. This site is called TradingView. We'll talk about that later. And this is currently Euro USD, right? Euro versus uh, the United States dollar, right? Europe, right? So we click here. And let's just say you think price is going to go up, right? But you're at work. You don't know what you're like. You're not really on your phone. You're at the gym. You put a buy stop up here right what that means is if price starts to come up let me actually get like a brush tool 
I'll explain all this uh, a little bit later. If price has to come up, you're not in the trade. You're not in the trade. The minute it hits here, you are instantly in the trade. At that, that's your entry point, right? You're in the trade right there. That's a buy stop. As price is going up, it's right here, right? It's going right through it, and it's going all the way up. So if you click play, let me actually do it a little bit slower. Like you're obviously in profit right now. You're in profit because you had a buy stop right here, and price is shot all the way through it. That is a buy stop, right? You place a, a stop, basically a buy stop, above price, and you're not in the trade because you didn't want to get in. You didn't want to execute right then and there. You thought price would drop a little bit longer. You were at work. And if you put, like, let's say you put that buy stop. This is 1.180002 uh, or 020, right? So let's go back to the iPad for a uh, second, right? If the buy stop was at 1.180020, one eight zero two zero and price is at one point one seven eight hundred and it slows up to go up the minute it hits here you're in the trade and you make money the more it goes up right that's a buy stop a buy limit is the opposite right price is going down right price is shooting down let's just say price is at one point one seven eight hundred and let's just say you think price is going to get to one point one seven two hundred right like you just know based off the technicals and the fundamentals you believe that is a area where you know i think price is going to reverse it struggled there in the past right if you think that's going to happen you put a buy limit down here i just erased it excuse me guys a buy limit down here and its price is dropping to 1 1.17 1.17400 all the way to 1.17200 you are in for a buy now if price goes a little bit lower you're losing money but if price decides to automatically reverse like you thought it was, you are now making money. That is a buy limit. And let me actually show you guys on the chart as well so you guys actually know what's going on. Let me actually uh, put the bar, uh, the chart back to normal. Let's actually get rid of that drawing. So let's just say this number is 1.17800, right? So let's just say, this is bar replay, right? And you saw it going down here, but you think that, you know, the minute price gets right here, you want to get in for a buy, but you're not on your phone. And if you just click play, and it actually does this in real time, this is a demonstration, does this in real time, it touched it, right? So now you're in for a buy, but you're losing money, right? Because price done shot below your entry point, right? Because you're in for a buy, you're losing money. You're losing money, you're making money because it's above. You're making money, you're making money, you're making money, you're making money, you're still making money, you're still making money. That is a buy limit, right? So you're able to do these things. And let me actually go to the iPad again. And let me actually delete this. And I want to show you guys uh, a sell stop and a sell limit, right? Because this goes back to the point. Do I got to sit on my phone 24-7? No, you do not, right? If you are somebody who works a 9 to 5 job, but you would like to... All right, cool. I'm back, right? All right, so I want to talk about a uh, sell stop and sell limit just because it goes back to the point, right? Like, do I got to sit in my phone 24-7? No, like, obviously, it's it's good if you can take some time and analyze the market and, you know, have that balance between your 9-to-5 job or your freelancing job versus trading. But if you just like trading at a certain time, but that time, you know, you're working, you can place these different market orders. That's what, the, that's what they're called, a market order, right? So a sell stop. The exact same. I'm not going to show you on the chart because it's the exact. It's the exact same, just opposite. Sell stop means if price is going down, you're not confident that it's going to go um, down just yet. You think it may go up a little bit and kind of you know fluctuate. But the minute it gets down here, you believe that price is going to drop all the way down, right? The minute it hits here, you are in for a sell. And the more it goes down, the more you make money, right? Sell limit is the opposite, right? Same as a buy limit, right? Price is going up, and you got a sell limit up here. So you think the minute it gets to this area, price is going to reverse and drop all the way down. So it's coming up and it's coming up, it's coming up. The minute it hits here, you are in for a sale. If price goes up higher, you're losing money. If it comes back down, you are making money. So that is a simple breakdown of market orders. Uh, write that down, guys. Market orders. That's a simple breakdown of it. Um, and um, that, again, answers the question on do I have to sit at my chart 24 7 if you can if you want to if you don't want to these orders are, are here to uh help you now again also there's also a thing called a stop loss and a take profit now what that means is a stop loss protects you right so if you are out or at work and you're in a trade but you don't want to lose a certain amount of money at any point in time 
your stop loss is there to protect you. It'll automatically get you out. So if you decide you don't ever want to lose $50 and you are in a trade, the very second you are losing $50, you could break your phone and not have access to your phone for a week. Rest assured, you are not just losing $10,000 because price went all the way against you. The very second it hits $50, you're out to trade completely because you set your stop loss right there. A take profit is the exact same thing, right? You may not be on your phone for a few hours. And if you think you like price is going to get to this price point, let's say $800, right? And you don't want to lose that money, right? Because you could be up $800. If you never close, price can come all the way back down to zero. That's happened several times to me in my first few years of trading, a million times. And it's happened to a million people all over the world. I know it has for a fact. And it'll probably happen to you when you first start trading. You will be up a certain amount. And two things can happen. You can be off your phone, you come back, you're at zero or you're losing money. Or you want more and you think it's gonna get to $2,000, you leave, you come back, and it's at zero break even. Same thing, right? Take profit just ensures that no matter what happens with this trade, if it reverses or even makes more money, the minute it gets 800, right? The minute it's at $800 in profit, get me out, put that into my trading account, right? So the minute if price gets to 798, 799, $800 in profit, price, you know, the market will close you out, your broker, and put that in your trading account. Doesn't matter if price keeps going in your direction. You could potentially have been up $2,000. Doesn't matter. You got $800. You're, you're closed out the trade because you didn't let it run a little bit longer, right? So I wanted to break that down for you guys, right? And now we're moving on to technicals, fundamentals, and sentiments. We already talked about that, but just a brief overview of what we just talked about. The technicals, glasses back on, and the computer's here. This is technical analysis, right? This entire graph is technical analysis. What it really means is you're looking at, you know, the price, right, from all the past right previous price patterns the historical chart patterns and you're making a prediction based off what it did in the past what a technical trader is believing is it stopped up here right up here before in the past so the minute it gets up here again it's going to stop again and guess what it did it stopped again and went all the way back down right that's what a technical trader is obviously you can see that doesn't work all the time because over here it got above it but that's what technical traders do right they're looking for patterns based on what it did in the past just patterns they're not worried about the news they're not worried about other people's opinions they're looking at a chart and figuring out specific patterns and we're going to go over patterns a little bit later but they're figuring out patterns and they're using those patterns to determine their bias whether they're going to you know buy or sell right that is technical analysis fundamental analysis on the other hand is like we talked about earlier is all the news you know in the world right when it comes to the market, right? So when it comes to the Federal Reserve and their announcements, right? The unemployment rates, right? All of these analysts that are reporting these numbers, that's fundamental analysis. What a fundamental trader would do is take all these reports and base their bias based on what the reports are saying, right? Sentiment analysis is basically you're taking the opinions of everybody across the world and actual analysis and actual forums and what the, like basically what Basically, what happened with uh, Reddit, right? With GameStop and AMC. <clears throat> if you were in, you know, uh, Wall Street bets, that's basically sentiment analysis, right? The entire Wall Street bets was like, we're going to force the appreciation and buy a bunch of shares and enforce a stock up of GameStop, right? And AMC and Blueberry and all that stuff, right? That is basically sentiment analysis, right? That type of stuff probably most likely can't happen in the uh, forex market right because with the stock market a lot of influence can happen right you know uh netflix can come out with, a, with an announcement and you know cause the, the the price of their shares to go down cause it to go up same with tesla and people like wall street bets you see that whole you know everybody getting sued and robin hood and the owner and all this extra stuff with citadel that can happen with the influence whereas the currency market like me and 20 other traders can't just force euro usd to go up like that can't happen right that's going to be because of drone power and, and 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 all of these people who have way more power than we do the stock market wall street bet show they had power and they went against these bigger players right neither here nor there that is sentiment analysis right and what you will probably hear is that you need to be a little bit of all three and that's what i believe as well um actually a lot a lot of people will tell you fundamentals don't matter right only technicals matter i'm a person who believes 
all three matter, right? I, I look at the charts with technical analysis. I will look at the fundamentals and the reports, and I will look at you know, sentiment analysis and see what the vibe is around in the community, right? I still have my own bias despite what everybody else is saying, but I try to take all three to factor in my bias, right? That is technical, fundamental, and sentiment analysis. Now, major and minor currency pairs. The U.S. dollar has the largest economy, and they're responsible for about 80 to 85 to 90 percent, right? The majority of forex transactions. So what you should know is that every major pair has the U.S. dollar in it some way, shape, or form, right? You can't compare euro and, and GBP and think that's, a ma that's not a major pair. That's a minor pair, right? Major pairs, if I can go to the iPad again, right, are pairs such as euro usd right gbp usd right usd jpy japan right aud usd right australia nzd new zealand the new zealand dollar right and the uh united states dollar right usd CAD, right? The United States dollar and Canada, right? And USD CHF, right? That is Switzerland, right? These are the major pairs. You can see that the US dollar is here, 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 right? Because it's so strong, such a big economy, right? So these are the major pairs. These are the pairs who, if you look at the chart, the structure of the, the chart and the technical analysis and the patterns may be more smooth and more easier to read because it's more widely traded, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. They're, these are major pairs, right? Miners are pairs that don't involve the U.S. dollar, right? So if I can just erase this and just put GBP here, that is a minor pair. That doesn't mean it doesn't move. Like sometimes miners move more than the majors, right? Because it has a lot of volatility, right? A lot of volatility, right? The more the more people who, who are trading in the market with a specific pair, the smoother it is. There's a lot of people trading. The less people trading a specific pair, the less it is <clears throat> it is regarded in terms of like all these forex transactions and how much it moves and the volume. It is more volatile. It moves a lot crazier. Up, down, up, down, all crazy, right? So keep that in your mind, right? You, you, you take this out. Actually, I should have kept that again, right? GBP. And you like replace that with AUD, right? GBP, AUD, uh, Great Britain pound, and the Australian dollar. That is a minor pair as well, right? I can remove this and just put Euro, right? Euro, JPY. That is a minor pair, right? These pairs don't involve the US dollar. Keep that in your mind. Now, again, that is a minor. Now, you will hear something called an exotic pair, but you will probably never trade it in your life. And if you do, I'm going to pray for you because I'm scared of you, right? Because... These exotic pairs, they're, oh my gosh, we didn't even talk about spreads yet and all that stuff, but like, it is so crazy to trade these pairs, it's not even worth it, right? So pairs like the United States and Mexico, United States and Thailand, United States and Brazil, right? You can look them up, but these are called exotic pairs. They're, they're barely traded at all. They're not major, comp uh, not companies, major countries. Their GDP is for that country is not even comparable to the United States dollar and China and the United Kingdom and all that stuff, right? So keep that in your mind. Now, a lot of people try to you know stick between you know a few majors and a few minors. That all depends on you. Once you start demo trading on a, like a, a fake account, you will know what pairs work for you, right? I've been in this market and, and analyzing and trading for you know six years now. I know what pairs I like, right? I know I don't like New Zealand USD. Why? Because I've traded it and I've lost money on it. And not just I lost money, but every time I traded this pair in 2015, and it just seemed like I didn't know what I was doing, right? It just seemed I just could not understand why I was moving and how to get in. I just couldn't understand it. So some pairs will be a lot easier to you to trade than others. And that's how you know what your favorite pairs are. That's only that's not going to come with reading the market because you can open the market and just like any pair based on what you see. You actually have to trade it on a demo account, right? A fake account and see what pairs you're making the most money with over a sustained period of time. You can't just do it for a week. Do it over five, six months. Get a track record and see, OK, over six months, I lost 
20 out of 22 trades with AUD USD. Okay, I'm not trading Australia and the US dollar, but I've won 40 out of 48 trades with your USD. That is one of my favorites. So that's how you kind of figure out, you know, what pairs to trade, major or minor, right? There's no wrong answer. Um, I would say, just to kind of give you guys a uh, uh, heads up, I would not trade out the gate GDP, JPY. This is the most volatile pair when it comes uh, in this Forex market, right? We take all the indices and, you know, the cryptocurrencies and, you know, the metals like gold and stuff out of it. In terms of currency pairs, GDP, JPY is the most volatile. So I would stay away from this one, but like test a few majors out, test a few minors like GBP, AUD and Euro, JPY and test them out, see if you like it or not, and then make a decision. Let me delete this and get on to the next topic, which is margin and leverage. So what it basically is, is people may ask, how can I, you know, trade or, or have a bigger account or, or, you know, trade a certain size if I don't have that much money, if I don't have, you know, $100,000 or $10,000. The thing called leverage, right? And what leverage is, is basically giving you more money than you really have, right? You're able to trade with a higher capital. So let's say the leverage is, I keep switching back from the iPad to talk to you guys, but I keep coming back here, right? Let's say the leverage is one in 100, right? And you put a hundred dollars, that is a ugly, that's, there we go, a hundred dollars into account, you're able to trade with up to $10,000 doesn't mean that you know you have ten thousand dollars in your account that just means you're able to trade as if you had ten thousand in your account right because a hundred times a hundred right if you had a thousand in your account right and you had a one to one hundred leverage you are able to trade as if you had a hundred thousand in your account same if you did one in two hundred it would be two hundred thousand so on and so forth that is leverage right now be careful with leverage because you know, obviously you can make more money, you know, a lot quicker, but you can lose money a lot quicker as well because you have, you know, the leverage is given your account, even though it's small, it has a thousand dollars in it, which is not small to other people, but neither here nor there, right? You're, you're, you're trading as if you have a lot more than you have. So you got to be very, very careful with it, right? I would, you know, in my opinion, I think it's always smart to use a stop loss no matter what, because if price goes against you sharply, it's not just going to get you out of the trade because your, your, your leverage is so high. If your leverage is so low, then, you know, your margin may get you out the trade, right? So what margin is, is basically your broker putting aside funds, essentially, and making sure you don't, you know, <laughs> force your account to go in a negative, right? No matter what, you always got to have this much money in the account. Your margin could be 2%, 3%, 4% of the trade. But margin is basically uh, ensuring that you basically never take this account into the negatives and owe them money. So let's just say your brokerage on that $1,000 account right let's just say your broker you know wanted had a had a margin of two percent right and that's basically twenty dollars that doesn't mean if you lose twenty dollars your broker's gonna close you out the trade that just means if you're losing so much money that your account goes all the way to twenty dollars your broker's gonna close you out the trade in the store you're gonna get something called a margin call that's basically when the broker is just like get out the trade you're clearly losing so much money yeah you're not gonna close it we're gonna close it ourselves right so that is margin that is leverage that is basically how you're able to trade with more capital than you actually have like leverage but be careful with leverage you know because obviously as i said earlier you know the higher your leverage is yes you can make more money a lot quicker but you also could lose a lot you know money a lot quicker because your broker is not going to stop you and be like you don't have enough money to open this type of position right so again for example we're going to get to lot size in a second but if you had a one in 100 leverage on a hundred dollar account and you want to open up a position worth seven thousand dollars you can your broker's not going to stop you because your leverage is that high if your leverage is lower like a one-to-one -one or one to whatever you can't open a trade that big right? so we're going to talk about sessions now right and in about maybe 15 minutes we should be uh, talking about technical analysis and actually breaking down how to actually trade um but sessions right there are three sessions right there's something called a new york session there's a London session and there is an Asian session, Tokyo session, right? So basically what that means is obviously New York session is nine to five for, for us, right? Basically, or basically eight to five, right? That's basically the time where we're up, right? When Wall Street is moving, right? When most of us are going to work, right? That is called New York session, 8 a.m. Eastern here. It ends at five. That is when a lot of the United States dollar, right, pairs, you know, like the, the USD, a little bit of euro, 
but the USD is moving, right? It's, it's moving. A lot of the transactions are occurring. A lot of the news regarding the US dollar tend to you know, come out during the New York session. That's the New York session. The Asian session is obviously when the market uh, resets at like five o'clock, but it really starts at like seven. From like 7 p.m. Eastern time to about three o'clock in the morning, right? That is Asian session. That is when, you know, Australia, New Zealand, right? Gold, right? Which is a metal, right? You know, Japan, these pairs are the most volatile during these type of sessions, right? Because that is when their economy is moving, right? London session, right? Which is the most volatile session out of them all. New York is closely behind, but London is the most volatile session of them all. And it is considered the forex capital of everything and everywhere in the world, right? London. Starts at around 2 o'clock in the morning, ends at around noon, right? It's really 3 to 12, but I kind of like to go to the charts like 2 to 12, uh, even sometimes midnight, but neither here nor there, right? 2 to 3 to uh, noon, right? And that is when, you know, Euro, GBP, like those pairs are moving heavily as well, right? And you may notice that some things kind of overlap, right? Like London, and if I can go right here uh, on the actual iPad, right? If London is... 3 a.m. New York time to 12 and New York is 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. There's a, a an overlap, right? 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. You're right. When two sessions overlap, that is the most volatile you will see the market, right? So a lot of traders like to, you know, trade during this time because that is when the two most volatile sessions are combined and pairs like euro and gbp and usd they're all coming out all types of crazy the market just moving right asian session this is more so seven sorry 7 p.m to about two three o'clock in the morning there is a session called like a sydney session that you know covers the whole 24 hours to starts at 5 p.m basically but you know that's not even a session like most traders even even worry about or think about um so these three sessions are the ones you really should be worried about um and this is more so jpy aud um new zealand right so back to what i was saying earlier right if you like to trade a certain pair see what time it likes to move the most right see what time it likes to move the most if you don't like if you want to make sure your schedule is different and you work from nine to five but you want to trade from like six to like eleven even a little bit later and then go to sleep at like midnight then you kind of want to you know look at these pairs japan australia new zealand these countries and even you know euro a little bit because there is an overlap as well with london and and asian a little bit right just a little bit um because like i said i like to look at london like 2 a.m a little bit and it likes to you know move i think asian is open to 4 actually a.m not 3 a.m you hear there so let me actually uh delete this and make sure it's more straight 4 a.m there's a little bit of an overlap like i said but um if you like to you know trade overnight like i said I, I found these uh to be the most useful right that is forex sessions so just make sure you're able to pick a session that works with your schedule pick a pair that works with you and uh move on right now one thing i do want to talk to you guys about before i get into the technicals is you know some things in my opinion that i think you know a new trader to, should kind of stay away from mlms right you should kind of stay away from recruiting you know uh, especially when they want you to pay two hundred and like twenty five dollars a month just to, to learn and you can offset that by recruiting people but you don't want to recruit people i would stay away from that copy and paste signals they don't work not saying some traders aren't good traders i'm just saying that you never want to rely on a single trader you know for like an actual trade right i don't think you should listen to me if i'm if i think your usd is going up and i'm getting in at one point twenty and this is my stop loss and this is my take profit i don't think anybody should follow me why because that's my belief if i lose i can live with it because i believed in my heart of hearts that was going to happen you can't because you listen to me and you're putting all your eggs on me right so I, I i would advise you guys to you know learn from like a me or somebody on youtube or, or somebody's program or a book or like i have like if you can see over here i have a bunch of books over here and go all the way down there right i would learn from that um and even trade with that right it's, it's great to have a trading community and trade with people right i have that you know within my program right i have a huge trading community especially when the new academy releases in about two weeks right it's good to have that people that that's on your side and on and on you know understand what you're going through i talk about you know with when it comes with a basketball team basketball players basically hang out with basketball players they all understand the grind and getting up early in the morning right same with football players right same with politicians right 
forex traders and stock traders, right? They like to hang out with each other. So it's good to have that community, but you should always rely on your own trades, right? At the end of the day. Um, so copy and paste signals. Don't join a group that's saying we have a 95% win rate and just follow, just sit at your couch and just put these trades in. And then no matter what, you'll make money. Don't believe it. Manage accounts. Don't believe anybody saying if you give their money, unless they're like an actual hedge fund or they're actually like somebody who's regulated, you know, by <clears throat> the government, right? I would not, you know, give a random, you know, person, you know, your money and then let them trade for you, right? Now, if you want to give them money so you can learn from them, that's different, right? But if you're saying, I'm going to give you money and you can trade for me, just be very, very careful with that, right? Because a lot of the times they may be Ponzi schemes where they, they may pay you out based on other people's money and they keep getting more money from other people and they pay previous investors and it's just a whole cycle, right? I would stay, invest, uh, I would stay away from that, right? Um, unless you've done some serious research and, and you can and you can you know they're licensed and a regulator, right? Um, I would stay away from 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 algorithms and bots as well, right? I, I would stay away from trusting a secret algo and, and a robot that'll trade manually based on you know the information you give it, right? I, I really fully think that you should be the only one to execute your trades. You should learn from other people and books and be around the community, but you should be the only one executing your own trades, right? That's what I would uh, recommend, right? Now, without further ado, let's get into the technicals. So with technical analysis, this is TradingView, right? TradingView.com is where you will probably spend most of your time. It'll be your best friend. Um, this is where you're able to look up, you know, all the charts and all the currency pairs, right? Um, so this is TradingView and it may look crazy uh, right now, um, but over here, if you click down, these are the time frames, and you may not know what it means. And we're going to talk about the candlesticks. Um, probably one of the first ones we talk about. We'll get back to time frames in a second. But these are like the tools to help you identify certain patterns. Over here is the exchange rate, right? Excuse me. Everything we've been talking about is the exchange rate. To find other pairs, you just type it in. Euro, USD, right? You click it. Oh, I'm on your right now, right? GBP, USD. You click it. It's here. I have a, a crazy chart here that you guys see. Um, but obviously, at the end of this video, hopefully you guys will be able to understand what all of this means, right? Um, but back to your USD, right? So this is a basic chart, right? These are called candlesticks, right? These are called candlesticks, Japanese candlesticks. You can look at them over here. You can have like a obviously bar chart. You can see, you know, uh, hollow candles. You can see Heikenashi candles. You can see a line chart. But most traders around the world, especially technical traders, use candlestick charts because they tell so much of the story and I am going to go to the iPad to break it down for you guys, right? So if I'm on the iPad and I can obviously uh, go back here, perfect. I need to be able to erase all of this, but a candlestick, it tells you so much of the story based on how you look at it and I'm just basically stalling so I can erase all of this. All right, it's good. So what the hell did I just do? There we go. All right, cool. So a candlestick, you may see something like this. And it's all red. This is a candlestick, right? So if you see something like this, they will tell you the open, the high, the low and the close of that time frame, right? So if I can go back to the actual charts really quick, this right represents I'm on a D right now, right? So that's a one day as you see below. So each candlestick represents one day in the market. This represents today, July 14th. This represents yesterday, the day before, the day before, the day before, and so on and so forth, right? Obviously, you exclude uh, Saturdays, right? Um, but it, it represents the market, right? So one day, one day, one day, you go over here. This represents four hours, four hours, four hours, four hours, four hours, and obviously six four-hour candles. This one, two, three, four, five, six. This represents one day, that one day you saw over here, right? And same with the one hour. Obviously, 24 candles represent one day. Four one-hour candles represent one four-hour candle. Hopefully, that makes sense. Even a two-hour. Two one-hour candles represent one two-hour candle, right? So that's, that's basically what these candlesticks are, right? So back to the uh, iPad, right? So over here, this represents, let's just say, one day, right? One day, right? Now, what this basically means, it'll tell you the open, the high, the low, the close. Let's say... Uh, the number, I'm actually delete this. I should have put this in the middle one day. Let's just say up here is 1.25000. Down here is 
sorry, 1.24, 500. Let's say this is 1.2400. Let's say this is 1.23500. Let's say this is 1.2300 flat, right? So, and obviously this, these numbers are, are very, very close and they're very, very wide. Like this is 1.23, this is 1.25. It won't be that close. Like it'll obviously be a little bit wider. Just for example purposes, what this basically means is in this one day, right? If price is up here, if your entry is here, and the candle ends up being red based on what your colors are, price opened here, right? It opened at 1.24400. If it, if the body, this is the body, right? This square is called the body. These long lines are called the wick, right? Wick, wick up there, right? Now, if it's a red candle and it closes down here, and I, I want to preface it again by saying that you can have the, the, the candles green, blue, purple, black, whatever, right? If it opens right here and it closes below the open price, it means price is going down, right? You see how price went from 1.24 all the way to 1.23500, right? What are these wicks, right? These wicks show you during that day, this is what happened, right? So during this day, price went up here to 1.25500 right it was here and it went up here right so that means at some point in time it this candle was looking like this it we entered here and then it went up and this was the only candle right ignore everything below this green thing was here right but as price is coming back down and it gets his entry point again this is all of a sudden erased but price does leave a trail behind to show you where it went. And that's where the wick comes from. So down here, price, the whole body was actually down here and it was still closed. <clears throat> but by the time 5 p.m. came on the next day, the market had got to right here and it closed right here. But price left a wick that showed exactly where it went. Right. So that is a wick. Same with uh, a candle in the opposite direction. Right. If price opens right here and it goes all the way up and it closes up here it is you know a positive candle it goes up it is a bullish candle right bullish uh language right if you hear something that says bullish that means they're saying it's going up if you hear somebody saying i'm bearish that means it's going down that's where you see the bulls versus the bears bulls versus bears right but if price opens down here and closes up here, that's basically what happens. So if it just opened down here and closed down here, you will get no wick. But if price sometime during this day went all the way up here, but it closed down here, you will have this wick. If price ended up coming a little bit, you know, below, like it entered up here, the entry was up here, but it was actually you were actually negative for a second, right? Because you bought and you know price went down. It was like this, but then price ended up reversing before that daily close and it left a wick and now price is obviously heading up, right? Low, high. So that is a Japanese candlestick, right? Japanese candlestick. I'm trying to go to the laptop and the computer. So that's what you see here, right? So the wick, right? There, I have it uh, black and purple because that's my color. But let me actually go to uh, original, right? So you can see it. All right, cool, right? So red, what does this mean? This means price right closed i mean open right here and sometime during this day i'm on a two hour right now excuse me so sometime during this two hours it went up here so it was green for a second or blue in my colors but it came all the way down here and then it came all the way down here but it closed right here open high low close wherever it closes at it has to open right next to it unless there's something called a gap and what a gap is, is if the weekend happens when the market is closed on Saturday, but something crazy happens over the weekend, the market may, let's say it ended right here, the market may end up, if it's positive, all the way up here, right? It does not have to, on Sunday on, at 5 p.m. when the market opens, does not have to slowly get up here. It can just open right here. Same if it's negative. It can just open way down here. That's a gap. But under normal circumstances, price closed here. The next opening, where? Right here, right? So price is right here. It goes down, so it's red, comes up, leaves a wick, comes all the way up, it's blue, comes
comes all the way up, it's still blue or green, whatever color you have, closes down here for just two hours. Next two hours, what does it do? Open, high, low, close. Open, there's no high, this is the high because it, it didn't go up here at, at all. Open, come all the way down and it closed, right? And it's a little bit of a wick, but closed right here, right? So that is Japanese candlesticks. That's also, you know, time frames up here and trading view as a whole, right? Now, what you should understand is the market can only move three ways, right? The market can only move, let's go back to uh, the iPad. The market can only move up, down, or sideways, right? So up, meaning bearish or long. If you ask somebody saying I'm going long, that means they're buying and then the thing is gonna go up, right? Down, meaning they're bearish. Did I just say that? I may have just said that. Up, bullish. Sorry, I may have just said that. I don't know what I just said, but up, bullish, long. If they're saying they're bullish or long or something, that means they're going up. Bearish and, and short. If somebody's saying that I'm shorting something, that means they think the market is going to go down, right? So, and the market can only move three ways, right? Now, what is the third way? Sideways. The market can range, right? It's called consolidation, right? Congestion, right? I don't know why this is not deleting, and I'm trying to delete it so much, but it's not deleting. Oh, well, right? But the market can do this, right? It can go up, and you may see on a chart, I'll explain in a second, like the market likes to move in like waves. It doesn't like to just go straight up. It moves in a little, little bit of waves, but you see it goes up over time, right? This is considered, right, an uptrend. Market can also come down, right? And I'll draw it perfectly better. This is a downtrend. The market can also go down, go up, go down, go up. Dude, just do this. It does nothing, right? It, it still stays down and it goes just as high, right? This is called, I do a box around it, right? This is called consolidation, right? The market can only move two, uh, three ways, right? So keep that in your mind, right? What an uptrend is, is higher highs and higher lows, right? What that means is the market will go up, and it's still blue right now, I'm trying to get it green. There we go. The market will go up, create a high, come down a little bit, right? Come down, come up. This high is higher than this high, that's a higher high. Come down. This low is higher than this low, higher low. Go up, this high is higher than this high, Go down. This low is higher than these lows. That's an uptrend. And you're able to draw an actual, let me actually get a color. You're able to draw a line that connects them, right? You're essentially able to do this that basically connects them. This is the trend, right? Where it just bounces off the trend. Bounce, bounce, bounce. And you're assuming and predicting that, you know, the next time it goes up and creates another high, when it comes down, what do you think it's going to do? It's gonna go right to the trend line. This is what I meant by calculated risk, right? There's so many different ways and reasons to predict where the market is gonna be in the future. You can be wrong, price can break the trend line, but you're basically going off of what price did in the past. It usually you know, abides the trend line, so we are going based off the trend line, right? We're basically going off the trend line, and we think price is gonna bounce off of it. We get in for a buy, and then price shoots up, we're making money, right? That's an uptrend. Downtrend is the exact opposite, right? A downtrend is lower highs and lower lows, right? So when the market decides to, it'll go down, create a low, come up a little bit, come down, this low is higher than that low, go up, this uh, high is lower than that high, right? Go down, this low is lower than the previous three lows, go up again, this high is lower than this high, right? If it came up, then it's not a lower high because it got higher than this one, right? But if it stays a little bit lower, it is a lower high, and it, it is a downtrend, right? I should have connected it a little bit better, but basically, obviously, in a downtrend, this should be uh, connected, basically, and it should go there, and it should go there, and touch as well, right? This is a downtrend, right? So it comes up, comes down, and where do things going to go, right? You think it is going to bounce off of this trend line. That is a downtrend, right? Consolidation, this is why I'm not even gonna do it anymore, but this is why I drew the boxes, right? It's when price is going up, down, up, down, up, down, and there's a, you draw a box around it because there's no trend. It's just going up and down, up and down, right? That is a trend line, right? So if I can go back to the charts, right? 
when you're looking at this, we can look at this and say what's going on, right? So we can look at it and we can draw maybe a trend line right here, right? From down all the way up here, right? So we get right here and price, price goes up, what does it do? Down, up, down, up, down, up, creates a lower high. This high is now lower than this high when all the times, right? We can draw an ellipse tool as well, right? Now let's just stay on drawing mode. Excuse me, this is the low, high, the first high. What I mean by high is, what is the highest point it went to before price retraced? And if you don't know what a retracement is, a retracement is not a reversal, right? iPad, a retracement is when price goes up so much and comes down a little bit. This little bit is called a retracement. If price goes up and comes all the way down, that is a reversal, price reversal all the way down. But a retracement is just when price goes all the way up and comes down a little bit, or all the way down and comes up a little bit, right? That's a retracement, right? So the high and the low is basically, where is the point where price actually retraced to? Oh, it got here, retraced all the way down, right? This is a low. Why? Because it retraced here and went all the way back up. This is a high. It was higher than this high, came down, low. Higher than that low, came up, high. Another high, right? These are higher highs, these are our higher lows, right? Another low. And then this, lower high. <clears throat> this is considered a break of structure. Basically, it's not abiding what's going on. This is a first sign of a reversal, <clears throat> right? Confluences. We want to talk about how do we know price patterns. We'll talk about the price patterns in a second, but how do we know, right? How do we know what's going on? This is one example, right? This high was lower than this high. This gives us a signal that price is about to reverse, right? That's number one. Number two, there is a thing called single, double, and triple, aka dual and triple candlestick patterns, right? So what I mean by that is pat, uh, these candlesticks have patterns, right? You, you see how the chart looks, and I'm erasing my iPad while I talk to you guys at the same time, but you see how the chart looks up here, right? This right here is not just a regular candle. This is not just a regular candle or two regular candles, right? This is not a regular, these are all, they all mean something, right? What does this candle represent? It represents a shooting star, right? In Forex, if you see, let me go to the iPad for a second. If you see a candlestick, right, have a long wick, let me actually uh, go back to, uh, sorry guys, right here, long wick, and then you do all of this, the body is down here, but it has a long wick, which is basically what you see up here. That is called a shooting star. What does that mean? Shooting stars are seen at the end of an uptrend. So what that means is when you see a shooting star, in your mind, you can think that, okay, I, I think that price is going to go down. This is reason number one, confluence number one on why the market is going to go back down. So not only do you have a shooting star, but price gave a lower high at the top, right? Let me actually uh, go back over, uh, over here. Sorry, I was supposed to go back to the uh, actual uh, charts, right? Right here, shooting star, right? Lower high. These are two confluences you have that now basically giving you a reason to get in the trade for a sell, right? So if you get in a trade for a sell, price goes down, you know, you're making money, comes up here, you're now break even because you entered right here, and price goes all the way back down. If you held it, you're still making money, right? These are reasons, right? This is why I talk about, you know, Vegas when it's gambling because you're basically just pressing and doing whatever, pulling the slot machine and doing whatever. You're not just clicking buy or sell for whatever here. You actually have reasons and confluences on why you get in the trade. Now, there are a lot more candlesticks you guys should understand, right? Like right here is called a bullish engulfing. And what a bullish engulfing is, if you see a small red candle at like a major area, basically this trend line right here, and then a big bullish candle that engulfs the previous one, that is a bullish engulfing. When you see this, it's a, a opportunity to get in for a buy because you, know, you, you can basically predict and speculate that that's what's gonna happen. Over here is a triple candlestick pattern, right? The, this is a pattern that basically means when you see this, you, you usually may see this at the, at the end of a downtrend. It's when there's a big red candle, then it's like a small little doji S, but a small candle in the middle, and then a big bullish candle that is basically the same size as the, the first bearish candle out of those three candlesticks, right? Now you see that here, and then you get a bullish engulfing after that, right? That is basically the first sign that'll tell you that, you know, price may be heading up. So get in tune with actual candlesticks. I'm not gonna go over every single one in this video, 
but I would actually implore you guys to, because there's a lot of them, implore you guys to study, you know, these few, right? Delete this, delete that, delete that. Uh, for singles, I would uh, recommend you guys look up a doji. It doesn't really have a body whatsoever, right? It's basically a big wick. It basically represents, you know, being indecisive in the market, right? There's not enough bears to like take out, you know, the, the bulls, right? Or not enough, you know, people buying to take out the sellers, right? So you'll see a doji if at the end of, you know, the uh, time frame you're on, whether it's a daily, hour, two hours, it's like an equilibrium, right? It's like, there's, there's, there's not going up, it's not going down, it's just stagnant, right? Look up doji, look up a hammer, and inverted hammer, which is just the opposite. Look up a shooting star. Look up, what else are our single patterns? Oh, Marabozu. Oh, I spelled that all the way wrong, there we go. Meru, Bozu, and what this basically is, is like, there's basically not like enough of a wick, right? Like there's barely any wick to actually see. It's basically just a full body. And when you see stuff like this, this means that price has all the momentum in the world to continue going down or continue shooting all the way up, right? Mira Bozu, right? Shooting star, hammer, inverted hammer, doji. I may remember, remember more as, as time goes on. This is the only thing that kind of, you know, uh, is coming in my mind right now, right? Um, as far as a double, right? As far as a double, I want you to look up a double top, right? So a double top, double bottom. I want you to look up bullish engulfing, bearish engulfing right i want you to look up tweezer oh it's an e tweezer top and a tweezer bottom um and again if i think of more i will uh obviously talk about it some more but these are just things off the top of my head right and for triple the last one for these candlesticks right what i want you to, to look up as well is uh triple and what you may see is a head and shoulders or inverted, right? That's the opposite. And a uh, morning star, which is what we just talked about over there, the morning star, which is the three candlestick pattern, which is the, the red all the way down, a little doji in the middle and, and a bullish one all the way up and an evening star right and again if i think of more i would tell you as well but these are the ones that's coming to my head because from my opinion these are the most significant and when you see these make sure you're looking at what the overall picture is because they're trying to tell you something right if i scale back this is a double bottom right basically a w price comes down comes up comes down and the bottom is basically the same as the original one what does this tell you a double bottom is basically saying that price is about to head up so when you see this so I'm still in drawing mode. So when you see this bottom, bottom, and you see this bullish engulfing right here, small red candle bullish engulfing, that kind of gives you an incentive to try to get in and in, in for a trade, right? And price comes down, you're losing, and then it shoots all the way back up, right? So that these are, are things you should uh, uh, know and understand and realize when it comes to this market as a whole, right? This is basically considered a doji, right? A lot of wick, small body doji uh you know a lot of wick barely anybody they're just some things you should kind of understand right sorry guys i actually gotta take this rag off because it is giving me a headache oh, i gotta let the the waves out for a second man i gotta let them out for a second but i am getting a headache got the glasses on and the do-rag on that is not good for my brain um so we're gonna finish the video just like this but back to the charts right so that is a um those are the candlestick patterns that i want you guys to kind of really you know focus in on now let's talk about support and resistance this is actually one of the 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 most important ones uh on top of you know candlestick patterns and trend lines support and resistance right um i don't know why i circled that did i buy since i'm still in draw mode i'm trying to get back to my ipad with my left hand support and resistance what is support and resistance these are basically key areas right key areas where the market usually tends to reverse at right so resistance right resistance is the ceiling right comes up 
price can't break it, right? It's resistance, right? Resisting, right? Resisting, right? This is resistance. Support is the floor, right? You, you dribble a basketball on the floor, it comes back up, right? Support, 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 support. Support can turn resistance, right? And resistance can turn support. What that means is this is all support. If price breaks support, this is now resistance. Why? Because it's above it. So now it comes up. It's resistance, 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 resistance. And this is now the new support. Same with resistance, right? It can go up. And now what is this? It's below it. So now this is support, 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 right? That's support, right? So just understand that, right? Now, how to find support and resistance on a chart. People do it in, you know, many different ways. And I'll give you guys a few examples, right? Let me actually just uh, delete, you know, some of this over here, right? Uh, remove drawings. So what you should know is that what some people do is number one, they like to draw it at like wherever price stopped at, right? So they take this horizontal line and they draw a line right here, right? That basically has right, right? Price stopped up here, up here, got close over here, and people like to draw like a little bit of a box around it, right? I don't like to draw mine very, very random. I have specific areas where I like to draw it. I'll talk about it in a second, but. You know, everything below this line is considered resistance, right? This is resistance because it's resisting, resisting, resisting. Over here, this is support because it broke above and it broke back through. But up here, you know, resistance, or resistance, resistance, right? Coming down, you see price, you know, may have stopped, you know, right around here, right? So we can say, draw a box, right? We can say support, it came back up, support came back up, broke through. This is not resistance, right? Even over here, it came up, support broke through, came up, broke through, came up, resistance, came down. So you want to draw your support and resistance at areas where price stopped at. If I go to my actual chart, I will show you guys where I have my support and resistance drawn on. That's not the actual chart. This is the one I was talking about earlier with you guys, right? So I have mine right here. Like I have a major one at 1.42 and you guys you know kind of understand it now, right? Like you guys can read this now, right? Price is stopping a million times up here, right? So what I and it stopped over here. So I had like a major resistance area up here, right? What is this box? Oh, it's consolidation, right? Price is just going up and up and up and up and up. What are these three circles? Oh, this is a head and shoulders pattern, right? And I didn't explain the head and shoulders pattern, but the head and shoulders pattern is basically as I told you guys to look it up, but it's basically when you get a shoulder on the left hand side, a head in the middle, which is you know higher than the left shoulder and the right shoulder, right? You get a shoulder, head, shoulder. When you see a head and shoulders, that basically, you know, insinuates price is about to drop, right? So not only do we have this trend line up here, we see price is stopping way up here at this resistance area. So it can't get above here. That's basically my prediction. It can't get above here. I have a head and shoulders, price is consolidating, and it's starting to trade down lower and lower. And even up here, if I can go to like a two hour time frame, which shows, you know, more of the chart, you know, you come down here, price starting to trade lower and lower, breaks the trend line lower and lower. Now this is now a small resistance area where price is not getting above. I'm in for a sell and I sell and price drops all the way down. Why? Because I had about four or five different confluences on what the market is going to do, right? So my, my, my support and resistance area, you see resistance right here, uh, up here, where price keeps stopping at, resistance, resistance, resistance. And what you're thinking is, Whenever price gets to a resistance level, you are assuming that price may drop, right? You're, you're expecting a reversal, right? Now, you may expect price to break through that resistance level, right? And if you do, that area will now become support, right? But these areas are not random areas. These are areas where if price gets there, it's going to react. It's going to either reverse or it's going to either break through but something is going to happen, right? Over here, price is just going straight up, straight up, straight up. So you can tell like some of these areas are not really real life major areas. I have a line right here because price stopped here, stopped here, stopped here, and even over here, stop, support, right? Stop and then finally broke through. But even well, over here, you can tell price is going straight up, right? Going straight up, reverse, coming straight down. These are not major areas, so I'm not putting it there. But right here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine hits here. I can tell that's a major area, right? So we want to classify them as major areas. Just draw them on, and then you can kind of see where price is in comparison. So price is here. So this is clearly a major support area, right? Price is up here because this is a major area. Major resistance area because it's below. But when it was up here, 
this was a major support area because it was below until it finally broke through, right? So that is support and resistance in a nutshell, um, also known as key areas. Um, psychological levels, that is a little bit you know too advanced, and I have psychological levels up here. So if you want to go from here and go to my YouTube channel and watch my psychological levels video, feel free. I have, I have a lot of videos on my YouTube channel um, and even more in my course, right? But the YouTube channel, obviously, is basically like the free videos. And when you get to my uh, actual new website, you're going to see the clear cut difference when I do release it. But that is support and resistance, right? The last thing you should really understand is there's something called indicators, right? An indicator is something that, you know, it's like a, a robot technology that basically helps you decide if the market is going to go up or down or not, right? So you go indicator and there's several different ones, but I'm just going to give you a few right now. We're going to call it like stochastic, right? What this basically means is you're going to see down here, you're going to see a graph. There's a range between 80 and 20. What it means is Anytime what the indicator is saying, anytime price is at you know less than 20, the market is oversold and it's gonna go up eventually. Anytime the market is at you know above 80, which it was up here, which you can see it kind of represent up here, that means it's overbought too many buyers and eventually it's going to sell. It's gonna go back down, right? So that is what an indicator you know is supposed to tell you. A lot of times it lags, you know, it's it's behind price, right? Because it can only reflect what price it already did. So maybe a little bit late. This is why I don't like using them, but a lot of people do like using them. This is why I always tell you, figure out what works best for you, right? I'm only here to kind of tell you guys about it, right? So stochastic, right? There's stochastic. There is, I can obviously uh, remove indicators down here. There is something called RSI, right? RSI, similar thing where it's like 70 and 30. If it's you know below 30, oversold, above 70, uh, overbought, right? Um, there's something called a moving average as well, right? I'm going to just uh, manually, let me go to uh, a blank chart. Let me get moving average on here, right? Um, oh, up here, I'm tripping. Templates. So moving average, right? What a moving average is, it's basically saying anytime, it's these two lines in the middle of price, right? Anytime the blue is over the red, that's basically insinuating that the market is trading up, right? So you should stay in, in, in like, an uptrend right stay in your buys hold your longs right anytime the red is over the blue that means the market is obviously heading down right so you see blue over the red it reverses now you get this shooting star candle and a break of this you know support area you're in for a sell right so an indicator is just another confluence to help you get in a trade right up here right we talked about this morning star price comes up here bullish engulfing right up here, right, the blue crossover of uh, the red moving average, you get in for a buy, right? Because again, calculated risk. There are so many reasons why I should be getting in. And that's just the technical side. I didn't even talk about the fundamental side that may be pushing, you know, Euro strength in comparison to the US dollar or US dollar weakness in comparison to the Euro, right? That is, you know, indicators in a nutshell. There's a thing called the Bollinger Bands where, you know, it's two lines, right? And if it gets, you know, closer and, and, and closer and closer, that means price is consolidating. It's not doing too much. Once it expands, right, and it gets bigger and bigger, the market is moving, right? The market is actually lit right now, right? Um, but these are all indicators that can basically, you know, help you, I guess, try to trade. I don't like using them, right? I read a book called Naked Forex. Let me actually look for it. I have my books over here. Let me actually... Number two, it's right there. If you can see it, right there, I believe. Let me actually go get it, right? Move my do-rag out the way. I read a book called, where did I, I just saw it. I literally just saw it. Sorry, guys. Let me find it. I literally just saw it. Right here, Naked Forest, right? I read this book um, years ago, and it says, high probability techniques for trading without indicators, right? This book is amazing. Um, it's one of my favorite books in trading. It's not my favorite. It's not my second favorite. It's probably not in my third favorite, but it's in my top five or 10 for sure. It's probably number four or five because it's close. It's up there, but it's not my favorite trading book or my second favorite one. But this is the reason, this is probably the sole reason why I don't trade with indicators because it, it tells you how much they lag. But for every negative thing I, I can, you know, read and hear about an indicator, I you know, see people and I can find a book that gives you, you know, all the positive things in the world about an indicator, right? I, I can find just as much good people, you know, loving it 
but I personally don't use them. But feel free to test it out and see it for yourself. So guys, that really wraps up the technical analysis section, right? We went over, you know, everything I could possibly think of, right? Support and resistance, trend lines, candlestick patterns, indicators, you know, everything I could think of. Now we're on to the next section. So we're gonna talk about a broker, right? What is a broker, right? A broker is basically the middleman, right? It's the person who, or the company or, or, the, or the firm who basically executes your trades, right? You wanna buy Euro UFC, you gotta do it on a platform, right? You can't just do it out of nowhere. You gotta you know, join a, a, have an actual brokerage firm, right? Just like with the uh, Bank of America, right? You gotta store your money somewhere, you store it with the bank, right? So with a brokerage firm, you're using their platform, right? And there's two different type of brokers you can use, right? One is a, a dealing desk broker, which is basically a, a market maker. And one is a no dealing desk broker, right? Which basically means um, ECN, right? Electronic Communications Network, right? The two differences between them is a market maker broker, right? Kind of has a conflict of interest with you um, because sometimes they're taking the opposite side of your trades meaning if you're buying they're selling right because that's what the market is right you know if you win it's a zero-sum game right what that means is if you win somebody in the world is losing right if you lose somebody in the world is winning right and what market makers do is they try to match you up with somebody who's selling the pair you're buying or buying the pair you're selling if they can't find that person right at the split second that you're trying to get in or the, the little two second pause they will take the opposite side of your trade right and that kind of sucks because that means basically if you win they lose they just lost money and they don't want to lose right and the market makers are essentially making the market right it's a representation of what the real market is saying you're not actually trading the real market it's a market maker they make the market right now there's some benefits of you know market makers right like like a lot of the time the spread is fixed and we'll talk about spread a little bit later on which is basically your your cost of entry um of trading but um, that is a dealing desk brokerage, right? A market maker brokerage, right? And I want you guys just to know the differences, right? An ECN uh, brokerage, right? There's no conflict of interest, right? The broker makes money off the spread, right? So they're not, you know, taking the opposite side of your trades, right? And your trades are getting routed to a liquidity provider, right? It's getting routed to like these banks and these institutions out there in the world. And it's not, you know, being made up by a brokerage, right? Obviously, as you can tell, I tend to be more so on the side of like ECN brokers. I don't really like market maker brokers but there are some benefits to market making brokers at the end of the day even though sometimes it may be a conflict of interest at, at the end of the day their first objective is to match you up with somebody else in the world right so if they do that they don't take the opposite side of your trade right um and another thing is that they're not trying to just get you to lose money right because if they do you're going to leave their broker's firm and just be gone right their ideal client is somebody who makes money loses a little bit of money makes a little bit of money loses a little bit of money and stays long term and brings you know their people on so more people can use their brokerage firm as opposed to somebody who gets in deposits some money and then loses and then in two weeks they want a new broker that, that does nothing to help that market makers platform but at the end of the day a lot of people even myself like ecm brokers are so steer clear of that whole conflict of interest i'm okay with the spread you know being a very like varying meaning one day the spread of your usd can be six the next day it could be 13. and what that means is if i go to the ipad for a second I'm gonna put my password in. There we go. Um, what that means is, and we gotta talk about lot sizes too, actually. So let's talk about lot sizes and spread, right? So what it is, is it basically means the spread is, let's say Euro USD. You will see on a brokerage, you will see like Euro USD and it may say 600. That's the spread. What that means is whatever your lot size is, which is basically, you know, the currency units, basically how much money you're putting up, basically, which we'll talk about right after this. You multiply that and that's how much money you are automatically losing out the gate right no matter what right so let me uh show you guys an example really quick so your lot size right your lot size i want you guys to understand as well right lot size does not mean you're putting up money right so with investing you got to put up money right you got to put up money to buy the shares in the market you are not putting up and my computer is about to uh my ipad is about to die let me actually uh charge really quick so with a lot size you are are not putting up money right with investing you got to put up money right to buy the shares with trading in the forex market you're not putting up a thousand dollars right you're not just putting that in just hoping that goes up or down no you're putting up from the cut of lot size so you're essentially not putting up any money right when a trade starts right they're asking you what do you want your lot size to be it's basically you know currency units right so let's just say you know, you want your lot size to be, you know, 1.00, right? 
So what that means is if price goes to 1.30000 to 1.30100, you made $100, right? Because every time it goes up, one, right? So if I can, oh, I wish I could show you on a chart. Let me just do it this way as well. 1.30000, every time this one, right? This goes up, one, right? 1.30001. That is a dollar because you use this lot size, right? 1.30002, that is $2. All the way up to 1.30100, you are now up $100. That is how you make money in the market, right? So your lot size determines how fast you make money, right? Because if price goes from, you know, 1.30000 uh, to 1.30100 and you use a... 0.10 lot size which is basically 10 cents you are only up ten dollars right you're only up ten dollars even though the market moved from here to here you're only up ten dollars right because each time this moved up to one ten cents two ten cents three ten cents at the end when it gets to one point you know three zero zero one zero you're up a dollar all the way to this you are now up ten dollars right so your lot size determines how much money you make how fast you make your money how slow you make your money how fast you know you blow your account how fast you flip your account whatever it may be right now if the spread is six and the lot size you use is 1.00 which is called a standard right it's called a standard lot you multiply this 1.00 times six equals six dollars what that means is the minute you get in a trade you will automatically be losing six dollars right that is your drawdown right so so that is your initial uh loss right so you click boom enter trade you enter no matter what's going on the minute you get in the trade you will see you're automatically losing six dollars it's floating right you're in a floating profit floating loss meaning it goes from negative six to negative seven to maybe break even like zero dollars to you know positive ten dollars but initially you will <clears throat> uh be losing six dollars so that means what that means is if on this trade you make let's say i don't know a thousand dollars right you will see in your trading account that you didn't actually make a thousand dollars you actually made nine hundred and ninety four dollars right because that six dollars went to the broker that's their fee right for ecn network right that is their their fee they take the money off the spread which i don't mind at all it's not a big deal especially especially when you make a thousand dollars and you lose you know six you didn't really lose it you just gave a fee right because you can't just trade for no reason, right? You got to give them a fee, right? So that's their fee, right? You make $10,000, and let's just say the fee ends up being $30 because you end up using a super high lot size. That just means you made 9970 right? But that also means if you lost, let's say, off this negative uh, six, if you lost $200, you didn't lose $200, you actually lost $206, right? So that's the lot size, that's the spread, right? So that uh, goes back into you know how uh, they make their money as well. Um, so I want you guys to kind of do your research on you know ECNs versus market maker and decide what works best for you, right? And when you're doing this, you know there's a thing called you know regulation versus unregulated, right? You know each country you know governs and has an authority that looks over you know certain brokerages and regulates them or unregulates them right a regulated broker basically means they follow all the rules within the country they're good they're regulated they're not they can't just take your money and run they're not necessarily uh, a scam some regulated brokers can be a scam but if they get caught then they're automatically banned right but for the most part Regulated brokers are, are good. They, they abide by all the rules. They pay all the fees. They do what they're supposed to do. You email them, they'll email you back. You wanna jump on a phone call, they will call you. These are regulated brokers, right? And all in all, your money is safe. It is trusted. So if you, let's say you, you make some money, you can withdraw anytime you want. If the company goes bankrupt or something happens where the company blows up, right? You still have your money, no matter what. An unregulated broker will give you access to more pairs, right? Because regulated pairs, understand, that means they're regulated, right? So the United States, right? The United States will not let you trade gold leverage, right? They won't let you trade, you know, uh, a lot of these pairs, whereas unregulated brokers will let you do whatever you want, right? 
regulated brokers won't let you have a, a super high leverage because they're trying to protect you from using too much of a leverage to kind of lose it really like all your money real fast um whereas a unregulated broker will have a one in 100 one in 500 one in 1000 leverage right they unregulated brokers basically give you the freedom to do whatever you want you lose you lose you win you win whereas a regulated broker they're you know abiding by the united states the uk right japan basically saying no you can only have this much you know uh, leverage right you can only trade these specific pairs and this is what it is right um unregulated brokers a lot of people would like to trade with them um because of what they offer you basically can trade bitcoin and gold and all the extra stuff that you want um leverage to it's very very risky i would advise you guys to do your research on both um it's always good to use a regulated broker because your money is safe no matter what but i do know people who use an unregulated broker and i'm not here to tell you guys what to do you guys can make the decision yourself just type best regulated brokers or best unregulated brokers and do your research and see what feels comfortable to you um one of the the biggest con of an unregulated broker is they don't have to give you your money why because they're unregulated there's no governing like there's no body there's no authority that's looking over them that's saying you do this so for example if you make twenty thousand dollars right you make that much money in the market and you want to withdraw it and it's on an unregulated broker they can give you your money right and and i've seen a lot of times where they have but if they don't want to you, you spend all the time making 20 racks. If they don't want to, they don't have to, and you can't sue them. Why? They're unregulated. All the government's going to tell you is you shouldn't use them anyway, right? The CFTC for the United States, all they're going to say is you shouldn't have used them, right? You should not have used them whatsoever. But an un uh, not an unregulated, excuse me, a regulated broker can't do that. No matter how much money you make, they got to give it to you. Now, we are rounding off to finish in this video. We got a few more topics to, to cover. And one thing you guys should understand is risk to reward ratio it is very very important right we are in the risk management section now right risk to reward ratio what that means is how much you know are you risking versus how much like you're going to get back as a reward right so an example would be one to one right which basically means with this trade i'll either lose a hundred dollars or make a hundred dollars right one to two means either I will lose $100 or make $200, right? Or one to two could be, you know, I, I can lose $300, but I would make $600, right? You're always doubling your trade, doubling your investment. One to three obviously means, let's just say I can, with this trade, I can lose $50, but I can make <clears throat> $150, right? That's that's times three, right? Or I could lose 1000 right just giving you guys some examples or make three thousand right so it's always you guys should you can do what you want but me personally i like to use one to two one to three risk reward ratios and up right because that basically tells me you know i have a, a greater percentage of a chance to grow this account right so if i you know get in this trade and i know no matter what the worst that can happen is i'm going to lose a hundred dollars hundred dollars right but the best thing that can happen is i can make five hundred dollars right i drew that very ugly sorry guys i can make five hundred dollars right that is a one to five risk to reward ratio i like my chances right i will take that right because over time what that tells me is the higher your risk to reward ratio is and nothing like unrealistic like a one in 20 risk to reward ratio i'm not talking about that but if your risk to reward ratio as a minimum is always like a one to two one to three one to four that means you can lose a couple trades and all you gotta do is win one or two trades and you're in the positive so for example if you have a one let's say a one to four risk to reward ratio right and let's say you lost let's say let's say you lost i don't know three trades right you lost three trades and you won seven right l w right and let's just say it's three hundred dollars you lost three hundred dollars but times four, you made $1,200 every single time, right? Every single time, right? That means 300 times, that means at the end of these 10 trades, you lost $900, right? Out of three trades you lost, but you also won 1,200 times seven is 84, I believe. You also won $8,400 for that week. So at the end of that week, you made a profit of $7,500. That is clearly an example. It, it varies depending on what you're doing because obviously this could be 100, this could be 400, depending on the one to four risk to reward ratio. We're just using these numbers, right? 
So you made $7,500 losing three times, winning seven times. Now let's flip it, right? Let's flip it. Let's say you only won three times that week, but you lost seven trades. You lost seven trades that week, but they were all one to four risk to reward ratio, right? With the same exact, you know, setup, right? Not setup, um, excuse me, the same exact, you know, amount of money, same lot size you're putting up, right? So you won three, you lost seven, right? And mind you, going back to 300, losing, and the gain is 1,200, right? So you lost seven times, right? That whole week, it may seem bad. Oh, I lost seven times. I only won, you know, three out of 10 means 30%. I only won 30% of the time, but what, guess what, right? Seven times 300 is you lost 2,100 for the entire week. Out of the three trades you won, three times 1,200, you made $3,600 that week, which gives you a profit at the end of the week of $1,500 in profit. And you only won three trades. So that is risk to reward ratio. That is why it is always good to use a higher risk to reward ratio and keep that as a minimum and then always, you know, use the higher ones if they're available. But if you use a one to one risk to reward ratio, that means you have to win half the time just to break even. And you got to win, you know, eight times out of 10 or seven out of 10 or nine out of 10 to get a profit with a one to one risk to reward ratio. I make 200, I lose 200. I make 400, I lose 400, right? If we can go to the actual charts for a second, right? We're looking at this, right? And what it means is basically if you have a short position, let's just say you, let me just delete this. You got a short position and you enter right here, right? What it means is if you put your stop loss right here and your take profit down here, you see this is a one to 2.6 risk to reward ratio. That means if I, wherever I lose, multiply that by 2.6 and that's the reward I'll get. When you keep yourself to this kind of standard over and over again, right, in my opinion, right, obviously the facts show that if it's this same risk reward ratio, you don't have to win nine out of 10 trades, right? Because it offsets it, right? One to three every single time, right? Even one to four, one to five. But if it's one to one, see how small that is? You gotta make sure, you gotta guarantee that you win this trade. Because if you lose it, that's one. You lose again, that's two. You win, two, one. You went again, 2-2, two, two. You're, you broke even, right? You didn't make any money or lose any money, you broke even, right? So you gotta be mindful when it comes to your risk to reward ratio and setting it every single time. So one of the last few things I wanna talk to you guys about is working a nine to five while trading, right? Um, I want you guys to, to really, really, really understand that, you know, just balance out your time, right? You're gonna have to study a lot. I know coming into this market may seem like very, very amazing and very, very, you know, good and, and, and it's so exciting. You have to study. Like you, you can't just study for two weeks and just jump right in, especially if you have a job, right? Luckily for me, before I started babysitting um, and before I got to college, remember I had, a, I had a whole summer to study baby pips and then went back to college and was balancing, you know, college out with studying, right? And then after college, had a whole summer studying again, right? You know, Christmas break, studying again, right? So just make sure, you know, you, you study as much as you possibly can. Um, but yes, I don't think you should leave your nine to five to just start trading. I think you need to have your nine to five for as long as it may take one year, two year, three year, four year, maybe take five years, maybe take seven years before you actually start trading for real. I've seen a lot of traders who in their first year, they were good. Their first six months, they were good. They quit their job. They were good. I've seen a lot of traders who, you know, were still working their job and trading in year eight and then year eight, it popped off for them, right? It all depends on who you are, your current situation, your psychology in the market. Do you experience, you know, do you have like greed? Do you revenge trade where you lose a trade and you jump back in the market trying to, you know, get back at the market as if you're gonna, you know, hurt it? Do you experience FOMO, fear of missing out? Like you're, you're fearful because your friends are making money with this uh, pair, so you wanna jump in automatically? Like, all depends on who you are. You got kids, you got responsibility. What do you have going on, right? That all plays into to factor how long you know it may take for you to you know get good at this thing. And I want you guys to also understand as well. Like, this is a disclaimer as well for like myself, right? Trading in the market is not easy, right? I, I just did a whole two-hour video breaking down the market as best as I possibly could to you guys and as simply as I can. But it's not easy. It's easy to study. It's not as easy to read financial reports and fundamental analysis. But it's it's very easy to like understand this market. But to actually trade it, it's a different type of, of level you got to get to, right? It, it, and that all comes from your psychology, which, you know, you will, you know, grow and evolve over time because it gets scary when you, like, 
you can start a demo account right now and start trading it gets scary when you're on a live account right it gets very very scary when you're on a live account and it's real money at risk right so i want you guys to understand it is easy to learn as long as you give it the appropriate time you give it the respect and you take like i said you, you study um but it's not necessarily easy to do it takes time it takes skill it takes a different type of mentality and i hope you guys you know have that in your own personal trading um, hope you guys can learn from somebody dope, whether it's me or me or not nah, playing with you. Like whether it's like on these books over here that I have over there, or you know somebody else out there. I hope you guys can learn from somebody dope. Um, but yeah, make sure you study. That is very very imperative. You study as much as you can, especially if you know don't know anything. Right. Last two topics I want to talk about. Right. People may ask, how much money do I need to start day trading with? And that's up to you. Right um my if you guys want my opinion this is purely my opinion this is not like advice i'm telling you to do it this is my opinion you know i think you should start a demo account you know after you do the whole demo account you know with the track record and stuff for yourself i think you should start with like a hundred dollars or 150 just a small small account just to get on a live account and see how anxious you get when you actually click, click buy or sell with money you worked for, right? Hard money that you actually earned and worked for, and you actually gotta click buy or sell, buy or sell. Just see how it is. Once you can control your emotions on a smaller account, then when a larger account comes, you're, you're a little bit better. But that's my opinion. But you don't need $10,000 or $20,000 to, to start, right? Eventually, over time, it, it'd be nice if you had $500 in your account, 1,000, 2,000, mind you, the more money you have, the more money you're allowed to trade with, the more money you are potentially able to make, right? Because you have more breathing room, the leverage is a little bit higher, you know what you're doing, right? Um, the market has time to fluctuate a little bit, but um, I do think, like a lot of people, especially if they're coming into this market after a demo account, they should start with a, a super low account just so they can see and get the feel of, of how it is to trade because it is kind of, it, it, get, it get dark in them streets, man. It get dark in them trading streets when it's like, it's your actual real money you're trading, right? The second thing I want to talk about is why do you want to start trading, right? And that seems very, very obvious, but I want you guys to really think long and hard on why you want to, you know, embark on this journey because this journey is a long one. This journey is not easy. This journey is a difficult one. This journey uh, is fun. It's up and down. Um, it's a journey like no other. There's no other, you know, job out there in the world that's like this, right? Where you know, it's up and down, it's like high pace like this, or it can be low pace if you're a swing trader, which I gotta talk about, I even forgot about, I gotta talk about the different type of traders you are. Um, but I want you to figure out why you want to start trading, right? For me, I was broke in college, I wanted to start investing in trading, the stock market had that PDT rule, Forex was an easier entry for me than options in real estate, let me do Forex, and I ended up falling in love with it and kept it ever since. Now I'm obviously, you know, dabbling into stocks and real estate as well, but I fell in love with Forex, right? Figure out why you want to start trading. If you, Obviously, we all want to make money, but if you think you're going to come into this market and make money within the first four months, when I mean make money, I don't mean like, you know, make a few hundred dollars here and there. I mean like consistently make money and make $30,000 in your first two, three months of trading. It's not like that, man. It's not like that. Like over time, can that happen? Yes. Is that, is that a possibility? Yes. But I want you guys to know and understand the truth that like a lot of day traders fail, right? 90% of day traders who come into this market fail. And 10% only make it. And while that is a, you know, saddening statistic and it's like kind of like, you know, disheartening. On the other side, I can argue it's not, right? Because what if, like there, there's probably a million or so aspiring traders in the world. I got 300,000 subscribers on my YouTube channel alone, right? 306, right? Alone. So there's, there's more than, you know, there's millions of traders in the world. 10% of that is a good amount that can be successful, right? So let's just say there's a million traders in the world who want to learn how to trade. That means 100,000 are successful. That is a good statistic. <laughs> Whether people believe it or not, that's a good statistic. That's better than the NBA. The NBA is only 450 players in the NBA, right? You have less than a 0.0.0.0000000001, half of that, what I just said just there, cent chance of making the NBA. It's only 450 players out of 6 billion people in the world. Right. So nobody talks about the statistics to getting into professional sports. That's all like, go do it, go do it, go do it. Right. When you like you basically have no chance to be in the NBA or the NFL. Right. We all have a chance, but it's so hard. You got to be an insane athlete. You got to be working since you're two years old. You have a better chance at being a trader than being in the NBA based off the statistics. Right. But nobody wants to talk about that. 
But neither here nor there, my job is to give you guys all the facts around it. I want you guys to know that it's not easy and a lot of traders do lose and blow their account and 90% of traders do lose. But, you know, there are there are a lot of traders out there who 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 do win as well. So I want you guys to really understand and think in your mind right now, why do I want to trade? Obviously, it's money. But am I going to give the market the respect it deserves? Am I going to give it, you know, you know, months and even years of studying? Or am I going to just give it a time limit and say, I got three months to learn this thing. And if I don't, it's a scam and I'm walking away. Like, think about why you want to learn, right? Before I end the video, I want to talk about one more thing. The different type of traders. I, I forgot that early on. There's a thing called a scalper, a uh, day trader, intraday, you know, a, a swing trader and a position trader. A scalper is somebody who likes to get in and out every five, 10 minutes. They're in a trade, out of trade, in a trade, out of trade. They're in and out just like that over and over again. They like to trade in the one minute and the five minute time frame, right? An intraday trader, a day trader, is someone who likes to get in the market and close by the end of those 24 hours, right? The market resets at 5 p.m. every day and closes at Friday at 5 and opens Sunday at 5. So those basically 48 hours are closed. Um, an intraday trader like to get in at whatever time on, on Monday and then close by the time the market resets itself. That's an intraday day trader, right? 24 hour period. A swing trader is somebody who likes to hold their trade for a few days, a few weeks, even a few, even a month or so, right? That's a swing trader, right? They like to look at the daily, the weekly, even the four hour, right? Whereas the intraday trader like to look at the one hour, the 15 minute candle, even a two hour sometime. And it's then called a position trader. A position trader likes to hold their trades for like months at a time, just buying and holding right now can you do that in the market yes you can right like investing you got to buy and you basically hold it for a certain period of time but you put up a lot of money right obviously with invest with trading you're not putting up the money it's the lot size right and based on how much money you're making losing that's how much money you are making or losing right it's the lot size um you can buy and hold if you want if you want to buy your usd and just hold it for a year you can right but that's a lot of people don't necessarily do that, but you can buy a pair and hold it for a month, even hold it over the weekend if you want. It's risky because like you don't know what kind of news may come out over the weekend. You don't know what kind of unemployment rates come out with the fundamentals, which I didn't even talk about in this video, which I may do, which I just did two videos ago. So if you're watching this video, go back to my uh, how to understand and trade the news and, and analyze the market with fundamental analysis video on my YouTube channel. Um, it should be one of the most recent ones. Um, I think I did it like two or three videos ago, maybe four. Um, neither here nor there. What I'm saying to you guys is if you're holding it for a month, you're basically taking the risk that the market may have some news that may fluctuate the, you know, the price a little bit, but you are believing that no matter what, it's going to end way up here or way down here if you're buying or selling by the end of the month, by the end of two months. And you can do that. That's a position trader. Overall, this is the longest video I have done and I hope you guys appreciate it. I love you guys. And I hope it was very, very beneficial for those who have never seen me in action for the first time. I hope you guys like me. And if you are already here at this point, remember what I said earlier on in the video. If I gave you value, any type of value, I don't care if it's 1%, you made a promise to me that you would subscribe and like the video. So I would greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate it for the hard work I've done today is if you can subscribe and like the video. And um, I would greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate that. Um, other than that, uh, you guys you guys want more videos like that, but not just that, because that's obviously, you know, basic and beginners, more advanced videos. Go to www.theswagacademy.com. There's a timer on there because with the website you see right now, that website is flipped, right? Obviously, if you guys are watching this video and it's like you look at the date and it's like August or December, doesn't apply. But if it is still July, soon enough, the website is going to be completely flipped, like completely flipped all the way around going to be a the most amazing website in this industry the most amazing website that you've ever seen that is you know relating within the forex market right I, I promise you guys that you guys will see if you guys are on the fence about joining my academy and my community like i said don't even join just wait right now until the website obviously is launched if you are watching this video and it's august september october november and you're watching it for the first time then yeah join the academy because i'm pretty sure you know the website is already there and I'm pretty sure if you go to the academy right now, you will like exactly what you see. Like you will like it, you will love it, but don't take my word for it. Go to the academy right now yourself and you can make that decision. Otherwise, my YouTube channel is here and I'll continue to dump out, you know, more free and basic videos. And um, I love you guys. Thank you guys so much for watching. And as always, gang.